What kind of excitement is going on in Port Jervis, New York? Today on The Round Us, we're going to be learning about the establishment of a brand new transportation center. All aboard! In days past, the roundhouse was where the railroad worker united with the steam locomotive, each to prepare for the journey ahead. Today, it's where we examine the history, the industry, the machines, the hobby, and the passion behind railroading. News, interviews, stories, and more. So climb aboard. This is The Roundhouse. Welcome to The Roundhouse. I'm your host, Nick Ozrak, and this is episode number 120 of our Trains and Railroading podcast, where we're talking about everything in the industry and the hobby, you name it, and we discuss it. Today, we're talking to Carolyn Hoffman. She's the president of Operation Toy Train and is heavily involved in the development of the Port Jervis Transportation History Center in Port Jervis, New York. We're going to learn about what Operation Toy Train is. We're going to learn about this transportation center, including their upcoming soft launch event on the Memorial Day weekend in 2022. Before we get to that, though, as always, I want to make a point to thank those of you who are supporting the podcast on Patreon. If you go to patreon.com slash the roundhouse, you can help support the show financially for as little as a dollar a month. Although if you go up to say $5 a month, you get early access to episodes, $10 a month, a monthly hangout, and $25 a month, a free photo print every year that you're subscribed. So some cool perks that you should check out in there. I also want to thank the Age of Steam Roundhouse for sponsoring today's episode. You can step back in time to see the culmination of Jerry Joe Jacobson's vision and explore his period-correct, accurately constructed brick roundhouse. For more information, visit their website at ageofsteamroundhouse.org. Our guest today is involved with the development of the Port Jervis Transportation History Center, and she is the president of Operation Toy Train. Please welcome to the Roundhouse, Mrs. Carolyn Hoffman. Hi. Great to have you on. You're involved with quite a few things, so let's start with what Operation Toy Train is. Okay. So Operation Toy Train started in 2009. It was the brainchild of my co-coordinator, John Sabatka, um, after years of collecting toys for the Marine Corps Toys for Tots Foundation with restored military vehicles, uh, one of John's daughters said, hey, you run trains. Wouldn't it be easier to load a whole bunch of stuff in a boxcar? So uh, we started off with one boxcar and we ran on the Susquehanna, the New York Susquehanna and Western Railway and um, a little bit over the Morris County lines, which was operated by the Morristown and Erie at that point, and started trying to collect as much as possible in two weekends for Picatinny Arsenal in New Jersey. That then expanded into New York State as we got some contacts with the Middletown and New Jersey Railroad. And we started with just about 5,000 toys the very first year in 2009. And last year, we broke 33,000 toys in four days. Wow. Although, hopefully, you didn't break them too hard because they still have to be played with. No. <laughs> <laughs> broke our record. <laughs> well, that's excellent. That's even better. And how many cars does that fill now? What type of train length have you put together these days? So we've had a little variation back and forth. We were borrowing some cars here and there um, as we outgrew our one box car. We had borrowed a baggage car for a little bit, but that unfortunately needed a lot more work than our group could manage to put into it. Um, so uh, Rudy Garbley, my husband, managed to reach out to a couple different places, Wells Fargo Rail and CASX, and got us a couple more box cars donated. Um, so we've had a little bit of a fluctuation in what we have and what we don't have in different years. This year, we pretty much packed three full-size boxcars. Um, one um, is about, you know, I don't even know exactly what fits in one boxcar. That's not really something I can I can estimate offhand, unfortunately. So the original boxcar we started off with was a 50-foot 
ex Conrail car. We added two more 50 foot box cars and we pretty much filled them by the end of the day. Um, one year we had toys overflowing into a passenger car that was, you know, for the volunteers. <laughs> so we've had some good years and, um, it, it's hard to give a real exact estimate. Um, you need room for sorting and counting the toys because when we give them to the Marine Corps, they're counted and, um, put into different bags and boxes for them. So you do need to leave some space within a car for the guys to do their counting and sorting, but we pretty much pack three fifty foot box cars by the end of the, the uh, New York, Susquehanna and Western run. It's such a perfect Christmas story. This idea of the people getting together and filling the train up with toys. Oh. It, I don't think it gets much more idyllic than that. And I imagine that the reception that you've received over the years has been tremendous as a result since it's been going on for so long. Yes. Uh, we have seen towns that barely had any toys the first year or two um, just explode into more toys than we can try to figure out what to do with in our 45-minute stop. We're, we're lucky we can just get them all onto the train, let alone try to count them all, um, which is awesome to pull into a town that was okay the year before and you're looking out the window looking at piles and piles and piles of toys and you're thinking wow okay somebody got the message this year holy crap like whoa so it's really neat to see it grow it's really neat to touch people to have people come back to you and say i've been coming since my kids were little kids you know three four five years old and it it hit me the other day that uh, one little girl, a friend of ours, niece was three when we ran the first train. And I thought, oh, geez, she's going to be 15. No, 18. Oh, goodness. So it's interesting to see the Girl Scouts and the Boy Scouts that come back every year. And they've been doing this since they were five or six years old. Um, the people that will come in and say, I had to get toys from the Marines a couple years ago and now I'm doing better. So I want to give back and here's a whole, you know, bag full of toys so I can give back. It's, it's a really, it's hard to overstate the way that this touches, especially first time volunteers, people that uh, are on the train that haven't experienced this before, but have heard stories of 30,000 toys, 20 something thousand toys. And until you see what 5,000 toys looks like piled in the end of a boxcar, it just doesn't really click. And presumably you have also grown along with it. You're now the president. How did you become involved with it? Kind of by accident, actually. The first year, um, John Sabaka was with the MTA, the Military Transport Association, which is a group of military vehicle collectors and historians. And they had been collecting with their trucks and he worked for Norfolk Southern at the time. So we wanted to put this whole train together and he came to the group that I was involved with then another um, history and volunteer group used to run Santa trains and Easter trains, things like that. And said, this is what I want to do. Your group knows how to build crews. You've run these Santa trains for years. You know how to get volunteers together can you help us get volunteers to run this if I can get a train together? And the president of the organization at the time was away and said, hey, can you go to this meeting? They reached out to us about this thing. Can you go? Sure. Well, at that meeting, it became very evident that they knew what they were doing. They knew how to get this all running and they really needed us to provide crew management and bodies and uh, I said, absolutely, we're in. I have a bunch of people that would love to do this. And John said, okay, well, then you're co-coordinating you're co with me. You're going to be my co-coordinator on this. This is our management team here, the eight or 10 of us that are sitting there at this little diner trying to plan this. He said, this is our management team that we're going to make this work. We're going to run a train this year. Okay, fine. And it just grew from there. And as we expanded into New York state, we needed to have a little more, um, official kind of board of directors seats than we had before. John and I were always just the co-coordinators and there was the three of us that were the ones that formed the organization and that was it. So, um, 
now we had to have some actual board of directors and executive positions and uh here i am <laughs> and because of the success you've seen with this and some of the various other entities that you're involved with this has led you to the port jervis transportation history center what is the concept behind the center yeah it's kind of a um kind of a roundabout sort of thing so once we had equipment for operation toy train we needed somewhere to store it and there's just not enough available track in new jersey and we're we didn't have any kind of income we we ran the railroads donated time and fuel and people and we didn't have income so we couldn't really rent track space so one of the other directors said we should approach the city of port jervis we've been trying to run there for years and i know the city wants a history center or, or a, they've been saying museum for years new york state doesn't qualify it as a museum but said okay well let's try to put together something for the city of port jervis that was december of 2019 um we managed to make some contacts and i went before the city council in june of 20. um they approved what we were doing they liked the idea of having historic equipment on site they understand the history of that turntable and the history of that whole area how how completely steeped in transportation history port jervis is and they wanted something to reflect that so we knew how to maintain and operate the equipment they had the grounds and we put together the beginnings of what would become the history center and a year and a half later here we are we're opening up how steeped is port jervis in transportation history uh extremely um so port jervis actually is where the never sink and delaware rivers both come together so they were both trade routes in the 18th and 19th century um originally it was known as mahakamak which was a lenape word for always running because there were so many rivers and bodies of water and whatnot um <clears throat> around 19 i'm sorry 1820 ish the dnh canal was built through the area and the canal opened in 1828 and the mahakamak area became known as port jervis after john bloomfield jervis who was the main engineer of the canal so the dnh canal was a huge huge driver of income and, and commerce for the area um, up until about 1891 when it went out of business because the railroads were just much more efficient. So at that point, somewhere around the 1845, 1847 range, uh, the New York and Erie Railroad was built from the Hudson River all the way out to Lake Erie. So that was yet another trade route into Port Jervis. After bankruptcies and reorganizations, that ended up being the Erie Railroad that we know of 1895-ish. And then there was another railroad, Monticello and Port Jervis, which went from Port Jervis to Monticello, eventually became a branch of the NYO and W around 1902. And all of a sudden you've got multiple railroads, multiple shipping lanes, and just a ton of things going on in that little corner. It seems like such a sleepy little city now, but it's that it was a huge, huge area. Plus they had their own trolley line. There was a couple different traction companies that ran trolleys. Um, Motor vehicles were an early thing up there um, because with that much um, incoming commerce, it was easy to ship things right into Port Jervis. So motor vehicles made their way up there rather early. Um, so even though now we have no canal, we have no trolleys, um, there are still multiple railroads that run through there. Norfolk Southern, New York, Susquehanna and Western, Middletown and New Jersey, all freight railroads, and then Metro North, um, which is operated by New Jersey Transit in that area. So there's commuter rail right up spitting distance from our turntable. As somebody who grew up along the former Erie Main Line, but in Meadville, Pennsylvania, it seems like the Erie is one of these underrated railroads when it comes to history because it largely avoided big urban centers. So not a lot of attention has been drawn to it the fact that there's no steam locomotive surviving doesn't help either 
not a lot of diesels. So these are factors working against it. But there is so much unique history to it. It seems like obviously you're going to be focusing on the whole picture, but the Erie and subsequently Erie Lackawanna is going to play a key role in that story. Correct. And again, the DNH Canal, um, it's been operated by the New York, Susquehanna and Western over Norfolk Southern for many, many years. So there's history there. Uh, think about it. anything that happened a week ago is history at this point. We're going to try not to be too modern, but we are definitely going to represent the fact that there are multiple, multiple things that came through this area. I think in rail preservation, there's certainly a, a glamour to the idea and the story in general of folks come together and they work with the local government and they form the center and or museum or whatever the case may be. But it also comes with a lot of challenges too. What have you experienced that maybe fits into that narrative and what has surprised you in the process of forming the nonprofit, working with the city and local municipality and other adventures you've had so far in getting this established? So we've been extremely lucky with Port Jervis and the city government and the local municipality stuff. Um, I did, like I said, I did have to go before the um, town council and present this whole thing. It was discussed and voted on and uh, it did take a little bit of back and forth. And of course, there's city attorneys involved and they wanted agreements drafted up. But we were extremely fortunate that the city saw that we already had a history background. We have people that are from multiple organizations that already have experience doing this. So we drafted an agreement, went to the city, went to the attorneys. They looked it over with very, very, very minimal changes. It really just went through. We sublet the track space from the Port Jervis Outdoor Club, who is leasing it from the city. Um, it's been extremely smooth. The city is super on board with everything that's going on. They've been very helpful with uh, sending the DPW guys over with a backhoe when we're doing track work, as long as there's not anything else major going on for the city. Um, helping us get um, security cameras, which we're working at now. They're not in just yet, but they're going to be tied right to the police department. Helping us get uh, Orange and Rockland Power to uh, do power drops in the yard. They've, they've, we had to go through the usual, make sure the agreements are signed, make sure all the attorneys are happy, so on and so forth, make sure we have the insurance, et cetera. But generally speaking, we are extremely, extremely lucky because the city of Port Jervis is so on board with this and just keeps saying, what else do you need? What else do you need? The Age of Steam Roundhouse, a true treasure of railroad preservation in Sugar Creek, Ohio, continues to make great strides with a number of unique restoration projects. Right now on their website, ageofsteamroundhouse.org, you can read their roundhouse reports to see the ongoing restoration to operation of Eureka Western No. 19, the locomotive featured in the film Emperor of the North, two passenger cars, and the completion of Moorhead and North Fork No. 12. To plan your visit and experience tours and special events, check out their website at ageofsteamroundhouse.org and follow them on social media. Already, besides the equipment owned by Operation Toy Train, you have a number of pieces that you will be opening up for display. What are some of the notable pieces of equipment or artifacts in your collection that excite you particularly? Oh, geez. We've, we've got quite a few things coming in. So that's, that's really been great. So our green car, which we call our green camo car, is an ex-Pennsylvania Railroad X-58 box car, which was owned by Conrail and was their Safety on Rails Theater. So S-O-R-T, Safety on Rails Theater or sort car. Um, and it was with, uh, traveled with a caboose 
painted up for Operation Lifesaver. And it came to us the first year that we ran Toys for Tots. It still has one end painted black with benches and a theater uh, screen on the back to be able to show the safety um, movies and presentations that they used to show when Conrail used to travel with it for, for safety um, events, what I'm different town fairs, they'd bring it to schools. They'd bring, it was in Port Jervis quite a few times for different events in Port Jervis. So that to me, that's really kind of cool because it's been the entire um, history of operation toy train, but it has so much history beyond us. So that will be opened back up as a theater within the yard. We have a couple of really cool locomotives, um, Middletown and New Jersey Railroad, which runs right into our yard. Um, we were able to purchase their uh, MNNJ number no. two, which is a 44 ton switcher built in 47 for GE uh, by GE. Um, and it served on the Middletown in New Jersey until uh, just recently. Actually, it was up. It was in Middletown till 07. And then the parent company had moved it, but it's back up there now. We're going to be repainting that. The guys are working on getting that running. We have an X Orange and Rockland Power 25 ton switcher. It's built by Baldwin Lima Hamilton in 1955, which is kind of a cool uh, little little engine, but interesting history. Um, it ended up at the Jones Chemical Plant in Warwick and then was donated to us. So that's also real local history. And then just on Monday, we had our U.S. Army 18 ton little tiny critter delivered uh, built by Plymouth and 41. It's a really neat little chain drive engine fired, pretty much fired right up. Guys had it running the other day and switching the yard out with it. So those are fun. Um, we've got a couple of Erie cabooses coming later this year that we already own. We actually have all three varieties of steel caboose that the Erie ever owned. So we've got a riveted Dunmore, a welded Dunmore, and then a riveted bay window. So we're able to represent all the different steel cabooses that the Erie had. We're going to paint them each in a different Erie scheme, uh, represent the history of those. And then the dining cars, which um, the uh, the dining car society is going to be, quote unquote, living with us at Port Jervis. Um, they brought in a couple of really cool cars. One is their Lackawanna Diner 469 Um built by Bud in 49 for the Phoebe Snow. And so it would have been in Port Jervis when it was on the Lake Cities, somewhere between 66 and 70-ish. Um, <clears throat> really nice, fully restored, can serve full meals, big giant kitchen, um, really a neat car. And then they've got another diner, uh, which is their EL741, built in 25 by Pullman, originally for the Atlantic Coastline. And then Erie bought it somewhere around 1930, and it would have served around the Port Jervis area until about 1970. That right now is just gutted, but that will be restored back to um, as close to po as possible, you know, with modern upgrades. It's, it's going to be an interesting, interesting car. I'm looking at a photo of it on your website, pjthc.org, and all of those Pullman cars that experience pseudo streamlining or pseudo rebuilds always interesting to see the layers to them and it's looking in really nice shape what else is catching my eye as i'm looking on your website are these three circus cars so they are still owned by the dining car society um they are working on the one you see listed as the ringling brothers horse car which is 60017 is going to be eventually turned into their power car and storage. So they've got an Erie Lackawanna power car right now, um, with baggage car turned power car, but it's small. It's it's a it's a shorty box car or a baggage car. Um, so they'd like to move their generator and fuel tanks and whatnot into that horse car and be able to section it off and have a big storage area on the other side. So that would be very helpful. Uh, the Dining Car Society has already said that they will allow, happily allow Operation Toy Train to use cars for our train. I do have to have some way to house volunteers and make sure they eat and have bathrooms and things like that throughout the day. So the horse car would be helpful if it's got a big open end. We can use some of that for toys. Um, and then the other two are dormitory cars. They're right now 
they're about as utilitarian as you could imagine. They're uh, plastic shower walls like you would have seen in, in a dorm in college. They each have bathrooms and showers, but they're two bunks, a little tiny counter, a sink, and a microwave, and a little refrigerator in each one. And that's where the performers would have lived between uh, stops. I think they sleep about 22 or 24 a piece. Um, and they're, they're just, they're literally like bunks, almost like you'd see in a submarine. It's just two bunks, a couple of cabinets, and that's about it. But they're neat cars and they're in decent shape. So uh, one of them will definitely be put back into dormitory type service for uh, both the tiny cars volunteers and hopefully some of our volunteers. If there's people up there and it's late or they've got a long drive, we have a place that we people can can stay over if we have a long, long weekend of, um, you know, volunteer stuff going on. So that would be good. Um, not 100 percent sure of their plans with the other one. Um, but they're both in decent shape and they're both usable. So hopefully we can get both of them up and, and working again there. It's kind of an interesting history. Um, you know, they're both, I believe they're both Pullman cars. Um, no, one's Pullman standard, one's ACF, sorry. But they would have bounced around until they ended up with the circus and they spent a lot of time with the circus. So they've got interesting histories. They did. People think of, Pasture cars, and some of you listening along, when you think of a pasture car, maybe you're thinking of Amtrak with the center aisle, maybe you're thinking of pre Amtrak with the corridor. But if you haven't been on a circus car, you really have to think more like a Winnebago. You need to think like a an RV because when <laughs> yes, RBBB got when the Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey got the cars, they were completely stripped, tubed out, and completely rebuilt. And they do have personality in them because they served so long under that banner. They are, they're kind of, it's easy to think of just taking them back to their pre-circus days. And admittedly, you could make the argument that was more attractive. But as you said, history includes a week ago. And the history of these cars as rolling RVs on rails is kind of interesting in its own right. And I'm also curious in general about your partnership with Dining Car Society. I think we should probably, for those who aren't familiar with it, explain what the society is and the reason that you've partnered with them to house their equipment up in Port Jervis. What is now the Dining Car Society, plain and simple, used to be the Erie Lackawanna Dining Car Preservation Society, which is a mouthful and a half. Um, but being Erie Lackawanna Dining Car Preservation Society kind of limited them or ex extremely limited them to Erie Lackawanna. Um, and really what they wanted to focus on was all of the dining car and dining aspects of uh, the you know railroad history. So Rudy and I had known... Paul Capoloni, who's the president of the Dining Car Society, through some other things that we had done. And he reached out to Rudy and said, hey, you know, we, we need some help. Um, they were very limited in Scranton in what they could do. There was not a good place to park the cars to do stationary events where there was enough parking for volunteers and diners and whatever else you needed. And unfortunately, with the costs of railroading in general, when they wanted to run excursion events, they would have to charge an exorbitant amount of money to even cover the railroad costs. And then they really weren't making anything off of it. And as a nonprofit, we know how that goes. You have to be able to profit off of what you're doing. So as the conversation progressed, we realized that Port Jervis could be a very good location for them. There's a lot of parking. Uh, we're right in the middle of the city. There's a good draw for the community who was already interested in historic railroad stuff to begin with. Adding dining cars on top of our freight equipment was a great idea. Um, so that's kind of where the conversation progressed. We realized we had enough track to be able to make that work. And we facilitated getting their cars to us in Port Jervis. And now they can actually do some stationary events. And hopefully down the road... Um, it doesn't look like it'll be too costly if they wanted to work with the m &J or one of the other railroads and, and hopefully do some of their own excursion work again, which would be awesome. 
I feel like a theme that we've been touching on indirectly throughout this is this idea of partnerships between nonprofits, because here we've been talking about Operation Toy Train, the Transportation Center, the Dining Car Society, and on your website, I saw mention of the Tri-State Railroad Historical Society. It seems like this is the kind of thing where individually each group has a lot of good things going on in their own right. But by partnering up, you're able to do even bigger and better things and help each other find solutions. Yes. So just for, for clarification, it is Tri-States with an S, Tri-States Railway Preservation Society, not to be confused with the uh, Tri-State group out of New Jersey who does a lot of preservation as well. So it's kind of crosses over a little bit. Um, yeah, I, I think, honestly, since I started getting into preservation work in about 2007 or 2008, I felt like, especially in northern New Jersey, everyone seemed to be competing. That doesn't help any of us with anything. We're all trying to do the same thing. We're all preserving a section of railroad history or, in our case, Port Jervis history, transportation history. We all have similar goals. And by competing with each other and squabbling over whose volunteers are supposed to be where for what event and we want that car you guys swooped in and stole it from us whatever the animosities are doesn't help anybody and i've literally been saying it for years and years and years hey guys we all have the same goal here we're all trying to preserve railroad history why can't we work together to do that and this is the first time i'm really seeing it coherently come together in a way that we've got, you know, the support of the city, like we talked about before, but another railroad preservation group in tri-states, uh, the outdoor club, there's a group called the Friends of Port Jervis Art and History. That's a big all-encompassing name, which is awesome because they can help with a lot of things that we do with the history of the city and the transportation history of the area. So I think, yeah, it's it's been a big push for me personally for a lot of years is just we've got to be able to work together to do this stuff because individually each group is limited and the more we can work together on this the more funding that opens us up to the more volunteer base that opens up opens us up to the wider base of the kind of equipment that either people have experience with or access to or groups already own that we can all help preserve. I, I feel like we have to stop working against each other in this whole medium, in this whole preservation uh, uh, world. We, we have to really start looking at it as if we keep fighting against each other, nothing's going to get saved. That is very true. And that point segues nicely into another question I have, which is how do you see what you're developing here in Port Jervis fitting into the rail preservation and tourism elements of the region? It's probably a lot of different ways we can, we can do that. Um, right now we're pretty limited to our yard. Um, we've talked about the, the limitations of being connected with freight railways. We don't have a whole lot of excursion opportunity right this minute, but being connected to active freight railways, we can have visiting equipment possibly. Um, we're hoping when we do our festival and Memorial Day weekend that we will have some visiting equipment from some other railroads. That opens us up to partnerships, even for other kinds of transportation too. We've been talking about canal history and trolleys and different things like that. Um, we hope to be able to put in more track space um, we're already talking to the city and some um, some donors about that to open up not only you know more exhibits hopefully but to be able to shuffle things around in our own yard to keep it interesting to be able to work on things to show people what it takes to do this kind of preservation um, and hopefully having it up and operating successfully even in its its early stages you know may is going to be a soft opening for us not everything's done not all the tracks installed not everything's restored this isn't going to be a grand opening of okay here's all our perfect rail equipment but it shows the people of the region 
the progress we've made between December and now when we arrived at the yard and what we ca are capable of doing. And hopefully that brings other groups in the area into the fold. I don't know how else to, to exactly word that, but brings other groups in the area in, in a way that they want to help us and we can help them. I mentioned the Minisink Valley Historical Society, who right now has a, a bunch of archives in the Port Jervis Library. Now they've got a place where a lot of their things can be displayed um, relating to the transportation side of Port Jervis that didn't really fit in some of the historic houses or the old fort in Port Jervis. The transportation stuff was kind of secondary. Now there's a place to display that kind of thing. So hopefully seeing that this is becoming successful will bring other groups in the region even just to give them ideas. I would love to even have another uh, preservation group, railroad or trolley or whatever, come to us and say, wow, this is really cool. Can you give us some pointers? Or, hey, we've been in your shoes. Here's some things we found. I'd love to have it become a greater conversation than just, hey, look at the stuff we restored. The Strasburg Railroad is an institution in the heritage railroad industry, and its mechanical services department is proud to lead the way. With the knowledge and experience that has created one of the most reliable steam railroading experiences in the country, the Strasburg Railroad is excited to offer their expertise to the rest of the industry. Strasburg's professional team provides consulting and technical assistance to take your steam locomotive or railcar project from idea to finished product. They stand behind their work and always strive to meet their customers' needs for quality, historic accuracy, and reliability at a price that is fair. Unlike many competitors, they feature a fully equipped boiler, rail car, and machine shop, so the work gets done in-house, helping you to get more for your money. Send your inquiries to mechanical at strasburgrailroad.com and let the professionals get to work for you. We're recording this in April of 2022, and as you mentioned there, you're having a soft launch event during the Memorial Day weekend. What can people expect to see for that? So we're putting that together kind of as we speak. Uh, we will have our equipment that we've had some time to do some paint work and whatnot on. The Tri-States Preservation Group has a box car now that has all of their display um, items. They've got a number of things from the history of the area, pieces of uh, the machine shops, I think, um, different things that came from the actual Erie yard that's there. The National Museum of Industrial History in Bethlehem is going to be bringing up their uh, railroad car mover. It's actually an airport tug that has been used for car moves in Bethlehem Steel that was restored a couple years ago. Really cute little thing they call Tug. He's got eyes and everything. The kids absolutely love it. So that's going to be up there. They're also bringing up their steam calliope, which is going to be kind of interesting to hear. We have a, a friend who's going to come up and he's a, an or a church organist, so he knows how to play that. So that'll be fun. We've got various groups from the city that are going to come in and pop up tents and put their tables out and hopefully do some of their own fundraising. There'll be some antique cars, we'll have some fire trucks, we'll have some military vehicles, antique restored military vehicles, hopefully some visiting equipment that's not fully confirmed yet, but hopefully we will have um, at least one or two engines from other railroads visiting with us, and hopefully a couple of motor cars on display. That's going to be really exciting, and I'm sure that for you and your team, having put all this effort to get to where you're at already to see the public roll in and be realizing more of this vision is going to be quite exciting. Absolutely. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. After a couple of years of, of working with the city to get to where we're at, when we pulled our train in with Operation Toy Train and, and our Toys for Tots collection in December, um, Port Jervis was our last stop for 
the 2021 season because that's where our equipment was going to live at the end of our trains. So pulling in there at the end of the day, that Sunday, and realizing, wow, this is actually happening. And then immediately launching into as much as we could get done while it was cold out. Obviously, can't really do painting and things like that in the cold. As the weather got nicer, getting our cabooses looking a little nicer, getting things moved around. We've had cars get painted. It's all gone very quickly. And I'm excited to see how many people turn up for this event. Um, I'm hoping that it'll be very well received. It seems to already be recognized across some of your usual um, railroad aficionado uh, platforms. I've seen it. People talk about it on Facebook. I've been approached with my Operation Toy Train t-shirt on in Port Jervis. People recognize the logo now and the city's talking about it. People who have absolutely no interest in trains are talking about it because it's going to look very nice in a downtown area that has needed some sprucing up for some, quite a few years. So we're, we're hoping it's going to be a nice big turnout. Once you've crested the fun of having that event, what are some of the short and long-term goals for the site? So short-term, I'd really like to figure out when we can be open to the public. There are a couple of gentlemen with the Tri-States group who would probably be very open to coming out on a Sunday and opening the boxcars up and sitting down and waiting for people to come. And if people know it's it's open, they will. We've had people stop by not even having anything open to the public just to see what's going on. So I think once it's open to the public, that'll be that'll be something good. It's an easy it's an easy drive from some of the other things in the area. I mean, High Point State Park is only 25, 20 minutes away. There's people are in Milford, Pennsylvania all the time. That's only 15, 20 minutes away. So it, I think we hopefully will be a positive draw in the area. Long term, I mentioned we want to install more track. That's a big one for us. There's a possibility of rebuilding part of our roundhouse. The pad is still there. You can see in the aerial shots where the track was. We have the plans. It's going to be super expensive, but we're looking at that as a possibility down the road to have at least a wedge of that roundhouse back up as a full replica, which would be awesome and give us an indoor place to work. And um, again, some more track to be able to display things and move things around and put things in places where we can work on them better. Um, we have a flat car that'll be coming in probably by the end of the summer. So there's been some talk about turning that into a stage for live performances, local bands, who knows, local choir, the high school band, those kind of things. Um, there's some plans to use one of the boxcars and hang a large projection screen on the side of the boxcar and hold kind of drive-in movie style outdoor movies in the summer. Um, we hope to keep using our Conrail sort car, our green camo car, which has the little theater in the end of it, keep showing local videos, things about Port Jervis, railroad history, railroad safety, the kinds of things that Conrail would have showed. There's been some talk of a canal boat. Hopefully we can get a canal boat in there once we, especially once we have some cover for it, whether it's a roundhouse or a, a you know, a pole barn or something, something to cover it, you know, provide cover for it. But there definitely is, is talk about a possibility of a, of a restored or, or replica canal boat. Supposedly there's a trolley that exists in the area. We haven't seen it yet, but it would have run right up and down Pike Street, which is the main drag up into the middle of Port Jervis. That'd be awesome to have on site. So we've got a lot of plans and a lot of irons in the fire that are not as far-fetched as they might sound as I'm talking about them now, um, especially the building. It's It sounds like a... a far-fetched idea, but actually really could come to happen in hopefully the next year or two. That would be really neat to see. And a lot of what you described seems attainable over the medium and long term. That sounds like you have realistic goals set for yourself. That's our hope. Yeah. I guess my last question for you then, Carolyn, is you have so much going on. You've had such an exciting road to get to where you're at. So much excitement going on now. 
what do you enjoy most about being part of this group, these initiatives, and rail preservation in general? Without sounding uh, trite, (laughs) I love our volunteers. I want all of our volunteers to feel like they are necessary, to feel like they matter. I think all too often in a lot of preservation circles, you're you fit into a certain spot and and it's hard to kind of move around within certain groups sometimes. I want to make sure that all of our volunteers know every time they're there that they're appreciated. I try to say thank you. Um, but I think my favorite part of this whole thing is having a group of people that wants to be here, having a group of people that doesn't feel like they're being pressured into joining a work session or coming up for a work session because we've got something going up or going on and we have to have all hands on deck to make sure we get this done. There are days there's actually more people than I have, you know, screwdrivers or paintbrushes for, which is an awesome problem to have. Um, So I think, yeah, I think my favorite part of all this is having built the volunteer base that we have through Operation Toy Train and what a close knit group it's become having that transition into the Port Jervis Transportation History Center and just watching everyone love every minute of what they're doing. The Port Jervis Transportation Festival will be Memorial Day weekend. That's May 28th, 29th, and 30th of 2022 from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. You can learn more about the group in general and their plans and see some photos such as the aerials that were just mentioned at pjthc.org. Carolyn, thank you so much for coming on the Roundhouse and telling us more about what your group has going on. It sounds like you have a lot of really good goals, some neat pieces of history and are tying a lot of ends together. And that's going to be fun to watch evolve. I appreciate you having me on, Nick. Thank you so much. Now, the question of the day. Last time on the Roundhouse, we were talking to Cheryl B. Engelhart, a musician and composer who created an entire New Age album on an Amtrak cross-country adventure. Quite a story she shared with us, which led to the question of what music comes to your mind for a truly memorable travel experience. Loads of you had responses. First, from the roundhousepodcast.com, Thomas Wyndham writes, From its use in a documentary about the upgrade to St. Pancras International Station, I always associate Philip Glass's company with train travel. The suite always evokes a feeling of fast, sleek, elegant travel in me. Company 2, in particular, sounds like traveling through tunnels to burst out at high speeds into the light and scenery to be dazzled before disappearing into another tunnel to repeat again in another glorious valley. I recommend giving it a listen. And Patrick Webb writes, Love the idea of making an album on a train. I have a few nostalgic tunes I associate with train travel. The intro, outro music for Shining Time Station and I Know How the Moon Must Feel from the 2000 film Thomas and the Magic Railroad. From Twitter, Joshua Sturgill writes, My first Amtrak train trip 25 years ago was on the Crescent. They still piped tunes into the roomettes back then. Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, Southern accents all the way from Baltimore to New Orleans. I still think of that trip anytime I hear those songs. And from Facebook, Seth Roberts writes, The hum of the rails, joints clacking, the roar of the power climbing grades. If you need any other music on a train ride, you're riding for the wrong reason. I don't know that I agree with you, Seth, but I appreciate your conviction. And Frank DiStefano writes, Literally any time I embark on a train trip, the fast segment of Aaron Copeland's Appalachian Spring plays in my head. Probably stuck in my head from the BBC 1980 travelogue, Great American Railway Journeys of the World, Coast to Coast, in which the piece in its entirety served as a soundtrack. A lot of interesting responses as well that I didn't have time to share with you today, but it illustrates 
this bond between music and trains. And honestly, that's something that took me into my career as a filmmaker. I've always been interested in exploring how to use music as a means of emotionally conveying what trains and railroads mean to me. Your question of the day for this episode is, what was your favorite railroad holiday experience? Let me know on the roundhousepodcast.com. Links to social media are there. Thank you guys for tuning in to this episode and in general for listening to The Roundhouse. I hope that it is something that you enjoy and I appreciate hearing your feedback in general. I don't make a point of saying this a lot, but if you have feedback about the show in general, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Send me a message through the roundhousepodcast.com. However you want to get a hold of me, do let me know what you think of the show overall, because as we say here, the roundhouse is our house. <laughs>